This podcast series is full of difficult and troubling content from the start. Please take care while listening. In our last episode, the Crown star expert witness, Dr. Dowie Evans, went in with all guns blazing at one of his critics, Professor John O'Quigley. People, so for example, statisticians like John O'Quigley, who's the professor of statistics at University College London, says that the way you've decided whether something is suspicious or not suspicious hangs on whether Lucy Lappy is present. He is completely wrong. So what does Professor O'Quigley make of Dr Evans and his expert opinions? I have great respect for any doctor or, you know, paediatrician. It's, uh, they do wonderful work. So I have no problems with uh, Dr. Evans as, as a human being and as the great contribution he has made to the health of, of, of young people. But um, he's completely wrong when he's trying to analyze the data on this. And what of Dr. Evans' new line, that statistics are irrelevant to the case? The statistics is 100% the case, because if we remove the statistics, it's the only thing that points to Lucy Letby, even if there were evidence of some criminal activity. What points to Lucy Letby? Nothing. The only thing pointing to Lucy Letby was that famous chart, which is a crock, and I've shown it to be a crock, and the believed spike, which actually, given all the conditions we know in the hospital, is not a spike. So the spike, the inexplicable spike, is entirely explicable. I'm not the only one saying that. Several people have now said that and shown it. And the chart is bogus. So there is no statistical evidence. And if there's no statistical evidence, then there is nothing that points at Lucy Letby. Nothing, nothing at all. The professor is talking about the chart showing suspicious deaths and collapses, which Lucy Letby's presence is marked by X after X after X. Dr. Evans's reports helped create it. You could call it the Lucy did it chart. The chart is is fake. It's, it, I don't use the word fake then, I use the word fake now. I say it's a scientific fake because it is not reproducible. That's why I call it a scientific fake. And I, I use that terminology at the Royal Statistical Society meeting in uh, September, the 19th of September. And that's the term I used, nobody challenged that. And my point is that that chart cannot be reproduced. Professor Quigley believes that if Dr Evans looked again at the reports blind, with the names of the nurses and doctors removed, he would not be able to reproduce the kind of magical way he found the deaths and collapses were suspicious when Lucy Letby was there, and unsuspicious when she wasn't. Dr Evans says Professor Quigley is wrong. Professor Quigley says Dr Evans is wrong. Dr. Evans believes there is powerful evidence against Lucy Letby. Excess gas in the baby's tummies, increased insulin, bizarre behaviour. But there is a simple difference between the professor and the doctor. The professor has written a paper presented to the Royal Statistical Society setting out his reasoning. It's called Logical and Statistical Errors in the Investigation and Prosecution of Suspected Serial Killer Nurses. The professor can back up what he says. What about that Lucy did it chart? How did it come to exist? We don't know exactly how we did it, but we do know some things. We do know he was not alone. He was working with the police. The police were working with the consultants. Now, to imagine that the police never mentioned the name of Lucy Letby, that's just hardly plausible. It's just not plausible. So her name has to have been mentioned. I can believe Dr. Evans when he said he did his very best to remain impartial. He did his very best to ignore that fact. But as we say, (coughs) you know, unconscious bias is uh, by definition, they're unconscious. So her name is all over the place and it will be in the documents he's looking at in every one of them (laughs) or most of them. The police will know those names and, and her name. And that will have been conveyed via the consultants. So there's no way that that chart really has no value. I mean, it's simply the word I used in the RSS meeting was it is worthless. It should have been seen to be worthless. How it was accepted by the court, I really don't know. Um, (laughs) And of course, all the newspapers picked up on it and it was seen everywhere. This is the smoking gun. It's no smoking gun. It doesn't mean anything. It's not a gun and it's not smoking. It's neither of those. Yeah. 
I don't know about you, but in case people are wondering, I just scrape through my maths O level. I'm hopeless at mental arithmetic, and my accountant routinely bursts into tears when he gets my VAT returns. I'm a bear of very little brain, but I do love a chart. Professor Quigley puts one in his paper, and it's entirely blank. It's just like the Sherlock Holmes story of the dog that didn't bark in the night. The blank chart, the one the jury did not see, contains the evidence on the unsuspicious deaths. Well, they're blank. But guess what? Lucy Letby isn't present, the point being that what seems to define suspicious deaths or collapses against unsuspicious is the presence or absence of Lucy Letby. And that to a statistician, screams that the data has been pre-cooked, is fake, or, in plainer English, bad science. You're listening to Was There Ever a Crime? The Trials of Lucy Letby, Episode 5, Bad Science. With me, Edward Abel-Smith. And me, John Sweeney. Saying that a chart that an expert helped create is fake is a heavy charge. How did Dr. Evans reply to Professor O'Quigley? Here's the professor. And interestingly enough, by the way, when I presented my analysis to the Royal Statistical Society, claiming that the statistical evidence was worthless, I was anticipating a, a strong rebuttal from people like Dr. Evans, and I and not only did I not get any rebuttal there, he said, which struck me as incredible, but he said, I agree, it is worthless. Because what, what they have done now, which is rather interesting, Lucy's accusers, now they're saying, oh, the statistics, that's neither here nor there. The real evidence is to do with insulin, to do with uh, air embolism, it's to do with, you know, forget the statistics. But of course, everybody wants to forget it. In our last episode, Dr. Evans bristled when I put to him the point made by Professor O'Quigley that there was no true spike in baby deaths at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Isn't it the case, though, that there was a general spike, a general increase in the neonatal deaths in, in, in England in this time? That's what the statisticians say. Okay, so, so what, what, what does that mean? What does well, that mean? Well, what that means is that, that more babies in neonatal units are dying across the country. And so, therefore, what you're looking at is nothing that actually points to a serial killer at loose. Right. Right. Time, and um, time, uh, time and time again, the statisticians are just wrong. They're out of their depth. They do not understand what it is that leads to babies in neonatal units deteriorating, deteriorating dying. They just don't understand it. And, but, and, so, and, there is, and, and speaking to statisticians about this is a bit like speaking to a climate change denier or a Donald Trump supporter. It doesn't matter what you tell them, they don't want to know, and that's that. They are welcome to their opinion. I spent 30 years on a neonatal unit developing a neonatal intensive care service from scratch in Swansea. Your professor of statistics in London I'm sure he's a very intelligent person. I doubt whether he spent 30 minutes on an internet unit unless one of his kids was a premature baby. Professor O'Quigley did not have a premature child, but he emailed us saying, I did spend a lot of time on a neonatal unit, actually. In answer to one of Dr. Evans' jibes, when my grandson was born very prematurely. So, was there a true spike in baby deaths at the Countess of Chester Hospital? It does look like a spike. It's a rate. So we need to distinguish an excess rate. And every year in, year out, you're not going to get exactly the same number of deaths. You know, they say it should be between two and three. Well, it cannot be between two and three. One year it would be two, another year it would be three. But another year it may be four, you know. So it does vary a little bit. Now, we do know in the preceding two years to 2015, 13 and 14, there were four deaths in both of those years. So it was a little higher already. Now, at that time, I think it was late in 2013. I'm sorry, late in 2012. So we're talking about 13. 
they changed the status of the unit from level one to level two. They were taking in much, much more, well, sick. These children were sick, by the way. Many of the people involved in this, the consultants and the doctors and Dr. Evans have also claimed these were, in inverted commas, healthy babies. And that's obviously not true. They would not be in an intensive care unit if they were healthy babies. They were not healthy babies. They were babies with difficulties. You know, that's obvious. Now, you've upgraded to take on these more fragile cases. Um, there's the report of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, which came out at that time in 2016, I think, and um, it showed there were a catalogue of problems on the unit taking place. The senior nurses being um, <coughs> let go, replaced by very junior nurses, the consultants themselves hardly ever showing up, as you pointed out, some of them having other careers, it seemed like. I mean, careers in TV as opposed to careers working as, as medical practitioners. So there were a lot of problems that have been identified by many people, not just me, but have been identified that would lead to seeing a higher, a much higher rate. Now, um, if you analyze statistically the actual number of deaths, I think it was eight deaths or nine, I've forgotten, in that year, 2015, but you can statistically analyze it as one unit among a large number of units. So you're looking at the unit with the worst rate. You cannot analyze that by comparing it with the average. It's going, the worst rate is going to be worse than the average. Just like in the Premier League, the team coming top of the league will not be scoring the average number of goals. If you come top or you come bottom, then your average is going to be either much higher or much lower than the average. So you need to compare like with like. So if you compare the worst performing unit in the country, which was the, the Countess of Chester was shown to be by the Embrace data. I'm not sure if you know the Embrace data. This is a, a NHS um, structure which analyzes the data from these centers. And they placed the Countess of Chester uh, the worst in 2015. As a neonatal unit or the hospital yes. as a whole? No, no, the neonatal unit. I'm sorry, uh -huh. the neonatal unit was the poorest performer. Now, they weren't so poor as to be what I would call an outlier or a spike. They were the poorest, but the next poorest was very close, very close. So they don't really stand out as exceptional. They do stand out as being the poorest performer, you know? And in it's interesting to know that the year prior to that, there were two units, one which was the, as poor a performer and one which was a lot poorer. As far as I know, there are no criminal proceedings taking place in those hospitals, but um, that that is immediately apparent from the Embrace data. So the thing is, we get this variability. On top of the variability, we have the conditions which have been steadily deteriorating and have been pointed out by several people. It's not as if those deaths were unanticipated. They were anticipated. So, you know, that is an important point to, to, to consider. Um, once, you, just as in any statistical analysis, you can show something odd is going on, then you start looking at it more closely. Now, once we start looking at it more closely, um, we know where you pointed it out yourself, what happened, the police went off in one direction and one direction only. They were not interested in even giving any consideration to the possibility that there were some problems on the unit. We know many others, not just the staffing, which was poor, but we also know about the, the, the sewage, which is not a minor thing. It's not a minor thing, you know. But of course, across the country, all of the units are going to be dealing with different problems. They are all dealing with problems. Some have better setups than others. Some have less problems to deal with, you know. So the ones who have the less problems to deal with, on average, they're going to do better. They're going to have less deaths. The ones that really accumulate problems, they're going to have worse um, higher rate of mortality. So what, what I'm trying to say is that the rate of mortality, given all of these factors, is not exceptional. It was to be expected. Back to the suspicious deaths and collapses chart, with Lucy Letby's name all over it, the Lucy did it chart. Now, the jury never saw the other chart, the Lucy didn't do it chart, the blank one, listing all the suspicious deaths and collapses and marked with her absence. By deduction, we know the unsuspicious data must exist, but we don't know what it is. 
but some of that missing unsuspicious data has seeped out. And it is funny peculiar. So we do know that some of them were brought back to uh, Dowie Evans to reevaluate. We do know that some of the status was changed. I mean, one baby, for instance, died of um, asphyxiation. Asphyxiation means death by lack of oxygen. Medically, there could be an innocent explanation for a baby dying of asphyxiation. But on the face of it, it sounds suspicious. One is left with the troubling thought that the carve-up between suspicious and unsuspicious deaths and collapses was a subjective process, and that can be coloured by unconscious bias. We don't know how the Lucy Did It chart came to be drawn up. Professor O'Quigley believes it was a joint effort. But I do know, and nobody's denying this, that Dr Evans was not on his own in putting those things together. Those cases were given to him by the consultants, and um, then there was some... Through the, through the police, though. He's not working, he's not talking to the consultants, he's talking to the police. Through the police, yes, right, but the cases are putting are being put together by the consultants, and the police are verifying certain information. They are building the chart. OK, so, I mean, I, I said, did you see this stuff blind? And he said yes, and then he qualified uh, uh, his answer in a way, to me, suggested that he didn't see it blind, but he it didn't matter. Why does seeing it blind matter? Well, if you know the answer, I mean, the thing is that choosing cases which involve, let be, one way or another, we don't know that. We certainly know by coincidence, not really coincidence, knew Lucy Letby was, I believe, the nurse that worked the most. So she's the one that's going to be present for the most events. So that's just obvious, really. Now, it was observed, of course, before any investigation took place, that she was present for a number of these deaths. Now, those deaths went into the chart right from the word go. We know that. And so nobody's denying that. So already we have a bias being set in place as they're building up this, this chart. Then they add to those deaths. They're adding other cases to the, to, to, to the chart. We don't know how they're doing that. We don't know on what basis they're doing that. We do know that um, Dr. Breera and Dr. Jayaram are very suspicious or I don't know what about Lucy uh, Letby. So... Um, it is very, very likely as they're going through the cases, they see something that looks a little strange, such as suffocation, and then they notice that Lucy Letby was not on duty. Ah, well, you know, probably that was not suspicious. Then they go to the next one. Aha, she wasn't. That looks suspicious to me. Boom. In, in, in layman's English, what you're saying is because the chart of the 25 cases, because we got that then we know that um, Lucy Letby is in the frame. We do know that because that's the prosecution yes. case. We don't know exactly how we did it, but we do know some things. We do know he was not alone. He was working with the police. The police were working with the consultants. Now, to imagine that the police never mention the name of Lucy Letby, that's just hardly plausible. It's just not plausible. So her name has to have been mentioned. Once again, we don't know for sure how the Lucy Did It chart came to be drawn up. But remember, it was Dr Evans who knocked on the door of Cheshire Police, asking to be an expert witness, not the other way round. In our last episode, Star Witness, we asked Dr Evans directly when he first heard of the suspicions about Lucy Letby. When did you first hear the suspicions about Lucy Letby? when she was arrested for the first time in July 2018. This is after I'd prepared 33 of my 34 initial reports. That noted, there are some funny, peculiar coincidences. The most striking of these was the assertion by Dr Evans that several babies had died because someone had injected air bubbles or embolisms into their bloodstreams. He diagnosed this from a number of factors, most notably a change in skin colour, noted on several of the babies before they died. This is a very, very rare finding. Dr Evans relied heavily on a 1989 paper written by Dr Shu Li, a former paediatrician-in-chief at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Dr Lee's paper is the only piece of research which exists about air bubbles causing skin changes in neonates 
there's nothing else. But entirely independently, Dr. Ravi J. Ram, the lead singer of The Deluded, and refer back to episode two if you're wondering what we're on about, also came up with the same conclusion, that air bubbles occurred in several of the babies Letby is accused of harming. Fancy that. By the by, Dr. Lee, the author of The Air Bubbles Causes Changes in Skin Colour paper, has come out publicly to say that his work has been misinterpreted and argued that none of the babies in the Lucy Letby case had colour changes consistent with air bubbles. Remember, John and I are in no way claiming to have any expertise in the complicated science of neonatal medicine. But we have done our best to speak to people who are the experts, and not many come better qualified than Professor Colin Morley. Uh, So what's your name, rank and serial number? Uh, My name is Colin John Morley. I don't know what you mean by serial number. Uh, Serial number is a joke. Oh, right, okay. Um, you've, you've, got a, uh, you've got some O-levels and A-levels, or you've got a title. What is that? Professor. Of what, where? Professor of Neonatal Medicine. I'm retired from that now, but that was in uh, the University of Melbourne in Australia. And uh, you're also connected to Cambridge University as well in some way. Yes, I worked for the university for 20 years before I went to Australia. Ordinary people, such as journalists or coppers or members of a jury, may well not be able to judge who might be the better scientist. But most people understand the difference between, say, Manchester United and Tranmere Rovers and Tranmere Rovers and Andover Town FC. Professor Colin Morley, how many uh, scientific papers have you written in your life? Um, Over 300 papers, chapters, uh, and various similar things, but um, uh, research papers to try and improve the care of babies. Oh, actually, I thought it was 400 when I looked you up. Well, (laughs) it depends where you look. Um, More than 300. Okay, let's go with with 300. Yeah. How many has Dr. Dowie Evans written? Well, I looked him up on PubMed, which is a pretty good way of seeing what people have published him, and I couldn't find any papers that he'd written. So in terms of football teams, <laughs> as scientists or scientists of football teams, the score is 300 nil. Writing papers is not the be-all and end-all, but it does provide evidence of scientific authority, or the lack of it. And it gives non-scientists like us a bit of a clue with who we are dealing with. Aside from that, Professor Morley has some grave concerns about some of the conclusions which Dr Evans came up with. Dr Dowie Evans, he's been looking at the baby's notes. He never met any of these babies. He wasn't there at the time they were being treated. And some of them passed away. Some of them had collapses and, and survived. But he wasn't there. He's read the notes and he concludes that again and again and again, the cause of death must be inflicted harm, murder. Do you agree with him? No. I mean, I think, well, there's various things. I mean, that the baby C, the suggestion from a variety of people was that Lucy Letby inflated the baby's stomach with gas down a nasogastric tube. Now, that might sound all right, but I think it's totally improbable. I mean, uh, because you could put gas down there, but most of it would come up around the, through the esophagus and be burped up. It's a hypothesis, which uh, a theory that he and others have, have done, but I've never seen anybody refer to it in any report, or re- research paper. So it's just an idea that he and some of the people in Chester are trying to push, but I think they will have never seen it. Dewey Evans won't have seen it happen. Um, And I think they're just making it up to try and fit their theories to what they think's happened. Please note that since the first trial of Lucy Letby, Dr. Evans has now withdrawn that method of murder in favour of another theory, that she injected air into his bloodstream. But air injected into the nasogastric tube 
was Dr Evans's theory that the prosecution underlined to the jury. What do you think happened to Baby C? Oh, Baby C um, was, well, first of all, let's just start. Baby C was very, very tiny. I mean, 800 grams, just to put that in context, a term baby is 3,500 grams. This baby was not much bigger than my hand and wrist. Had all sorts of problems, but uh, the two main problems that we'll just concentrate on for the moment <clears throat> is it had bile stained vomiting and bile stained aspirates from that uh, uh, fluid sucked up from the baby's stomach. That is a major sign of serious illness. Now, it, that, it's not always, but the doctors should investigate the baby to see why it's vomiting bile, because it may be some sort of obstruction in the intestine. This baby, it was rather dismissed the vomiting bile, and they just said, well, we'll keep an eye on it. <clears throat> but they should have known that um, if they, this it needs urgent uh, review by a paediatric surgeon because it might need, and a lot of investigations. Those investigations into the cause of baby C's bile in its vomit never happened. So we come back to the points which we raised at length in our second episode about the quality of some of the doctors in the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital. And that instead of doing two scheduled ward rounds a day, they did two a week. If there is one thing to have at the front of your mind, it's this. Baby C was not seen by a consultant doctor for three whole days. Why look for a murderer when the obvious is in front of you? Let's put it like this. A very, very sick baby boy, weighing at birth less than a quarter of a normal baby, didn't receive intensive care at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Baby C got superficial care, and that lack of proper medical attention killed him. It's not just baby C that Professor Morley is concerned about. He has reservations about the mindset of Dr Evans and the conclusions he's reached. Take baby K. Baby K, the baby where there was a retrial, they said that Lucy Letby had dislodged the endotracheal tube. What is this tube? Explain it to the... Um, the endotracheal the tube is a very small tube that's put in through the mouth, right round the back, past the tongue, through the larynx, into the trachea. And so it's used for ventilating a baby who can't breathe properly. OK, and uh, so he says that Lucy Letby deliberately... Uh, messed around with this tube to kill the baby. Well, and I, and I should add, causing the baby's mouth to bleed. Well, OK, so uh, d just let me go back to the deliberately moving the tube. It was being said by Dr J Ram and I think also um, uh, Dr Evans that little tiny babies are not capable of dislodging their tube. But it's that's uh, too simplistic and... Uh, they can, and it depends where the tube is. When the person who puts the tube in has to manage, get it round the back of, and, and through the larynx, and then it's got a very short bit of trachea, probably in a baby like that, no more than two centimetres long. It depends how far the, tu the, the tube is in the trachea, and if it's very close to the larynx, it's very easy for it to <coughs> get dislodged by lifting the baby, turning the baby, moving the baby. And um, so it's something we see a lot. I mean, it's getting better because people are better at fixing the tubes now. <clears throat> it's very difficult to fix a tube in a tiny baby like that. So they're often a bit, uh, a bit hard <coughs> of getting coming out, the baby getting inadvertently extubated. So in the um, in this case, do you buy what Dr. Evans said about baby K? Absolutely not. There was no evidence for the, the fact. I mean, she was just seen, she was standing by the baby. Dr. J. Ram 
and, and the baby was desaturating, which is what babies, the premature babies do. And without any evidence, uh, he subsequently said she must have dislodged the tube. Fixing tubes in tiny babies is not easy, despite what Dr. Everence and Dr. Jayaram say. Please do not forget the scoop in our last episode, Star Witness, that a year before Lucy Letby's supposed killing spree started, a consultant at the unit, Dr. B, was reprimanded by a coroner for placing a breathing tube down the esophagus and not the trachea and ignoring the warning signs. Ironically, there is powerful evidence that a baby was killed by a staff member at the Countess of Chester Hospital, but the killer was a doctor, not a nurse. Lucy Letby was convicted for the attempted murder of baby Kay, but the jury never heard Professor Morley's view that premature babies frequently dislodge tubes. Is there any research work to back up his theory? How many papers are there, or what's the weight of scientific evidence that uh, premature babies can dislodge tubes? Oh, there's a, a lot of papers about tubes being dislodged. Do the babies dislodge them? Well, many are dislodged because they're not tied in properly. Dr Evans talked about a previous hospital uh, I think Dr. Evans spoke about a previous hospital, but it's certainly been reported, previous <laughs> hospital where Lucy Letby worked. Uh, there was a, a, a stat that the tubes were dislodged, something like 40% more. There was a higher, 40% higher rate of tubes being dislodged while she was working there uh, until she until she left. Have, have you heard of have you sort of heard about that before? Yes, I've seen that as Liverpool when she was there as Liverpool. I think she was there as a trainee nurse rather than a staff nurse, but tubes get dislodged and it depends on the culture of the unit, the experience of the doctors and the nurses, how well the tubes are fixed. So it doesn't surprise me that there's more tubes dislodged in one hospital than another. But one doctor at the Countess of Chester Hospital believed that he all but caught Lucy Letby in the act of trying to dislodge Baby Kay's tube. Dr Ravi Jairam claimed that he walked in on Lucy Letby, attempting to commit murder. Here he is explaining the incident on ITV. Lucy Letby was standing by the top of the incubator. She didn't have her hands in the incubator. What um, was she doing then? Well, she, just, she was just standing there. Now, tubes become dislodged. But this was a 25-week gestation baby um, who wasn't kicking around, who wasn't vigorous. The only possibility was that that tube had to have been dislodged deliberately. The only possibility was that the tube had to have been dislodged deliberately. Those are the exact words of Dr. J. Ram. But as we've heard from Professor Morley, author of 300 scientific papers on neonatology, and with more than 30 years' experience working with neonates, that is not the only possibility. Not by a long chalk. Premature babies dislodge tubes on their own. And that's a fact. And it's not just Professor Morley who has his doubts. In October 2024, the appeal court turned down Lucy Letby's appeal against a wrongful conviction. By the way, the appeal judges were not presented with any of the key points this podcast has raised. But this is what the appeal court said about Dr Ravi Jayram. The critical issue for the jury was whether they were sure of the evidence of Dr Jayaram. Uh, legitimate criticism could be made of his evidence. Although he believed that Letby had deliberately dislodged the endotracheal tube, he had said nothing at the time, nor for many months after. There was an inconsistency between his evidence and the contemporaneous records. If Dr. J. Ram was looking at a murder at work, why did he say nothing at the time? But if Professor Morley is right and his view is backed up by a mass of research papers, then Dr. J. Ram saw nothing unusual at all, and the jury at the trial of Baby K was told a dark fairy story. Now, we're going to touch on a point which was raised in our last episode, Star Witness, by Dr. Dowie Evans. At the very end of our 80-minute interview, the Crown Star expert witness, Dr. Evans, zoned in on the case of Baby E. You've not mentioned... Once, for instance, baby E. 
Now, this is the baby whose mother walked in unexpectedly, um, heard this cry that she described as horrendous. I listened to her evidence in court. It was devastating. She arrived, looked at the baby, blood around its mouth. Letty said, oh, this is trauma from the nasogastric tube. I only got hold of the type of nasogastric they used much later. This nasogastric tube had a plastic so soft it would not have perforated the skin and the rice pudding. Mother was so concerned she telephoned her mother, uh, her husband straight away so there is evidence at the time of the uh, telephone call and let me wrote in the notes uh, information that was factually wrong. Now, why don't you look at that? Well, we did look into this. Dr Dowie Evans brought up baby E after Ed and I had set out the possibility that babies A, C and D had suspected sepsis, perhaps caused by the raw sewage in the unit, and that other babies were far more unwell than the jury was led to believe by the prosecution. Baby E, for Dr Evans, was open and shut evidence of her guilt, blood on the mask noted by Lucy Letby at 9pm, but instead she wrote 10pm, a lie, making the baby suffer for an hour untreated. Baby E's mum phoned her husband immediately to tell him, and this was logged at 9.11pm. So the phone records prove let me lied. Or do they? Mobile phone providers commonly timestamp log calls in coordinated universal time. That's Greenwich Mean Time and Old Money, regardless of the time of year. And baby E died on the 4th of August 2015, during British summertime, so one hour earlier than the phone records may have shown. That raises the possibility that when Lucy Letby recorded the blood on the mask incident at 10pm, she wasn't lying. The prosecution may have made a mistake with the timings. After all, we're all human. This does not prove Letby's innocence by a long stretch, but it does cast doubt on the prosecution's assertion that Letby had lied on her notes about Baby K. And let's not forget, this is the case that Dr Evans invited us to look into. Just like with Sally Clark, every aspect of the prosecution case under critical examination turns to dust. We spent more than an hour with Professor Morley. There is simply too much detail to put into this episode. But what is clear is that the science used to convict Lucy Letby is no such thing. It's a bit rubbish, frankly. So why did the finger keep being pointed at Lucy Letby, despite the lack of any evidence proving she did it? No eyewitness saw her harm a baby. No video camera captured such a moment. Instead, the jury heard that premature babies can't dislodge their tubes, which is so much stuff and nonsense. Do you think this is a witch hunt? You know, it's interesting you say that. That's uh, a terms I've been using. It reminds me of those old witch hunts where they decided some woman was doing things uh, uh, and casting spells and all sorts of things, and then she got blamed for virtually everything that went on. And here it just seems to me that Lucy Letby is getting blamed for problems that occurred in the neonatal unit there is no evidence that I've seen for any of the cases that she actually did something. They haven't got the, a smoking gun, as it were. She just happened to... And then, the, if I may just go on with that, there's this business of, well, she was on duty all the time, but they don't say that she was actually looking after the baby. Just being on duty in the nursery doesn't mean to say that she's actively involved and I just feel yes she's been picked up as it were and blamed for all sorts of things that are going wrong um, partly because of the, the nursery wasn't uh, working very effectively. One last question it's possible that some of Lucy Letby's fellow prisoners might be listening to this. Yes. What would you say to them? Be nice to her please because there's been a lot of very adverse publicity, you know, 
killer nurse, all sorts of things. And I don't think that that's justified, but I know being in prison is a very unpleasant place and uh, other prisoners can do things to, to the prisoners they don't like. I understand, but I may be wrong, that she's actually being kept isolated, it's almost worse, because they're afraid that the other prisoners will attack her. Do you think she's been the victim of a miscarriage of justice? Yes. So do we. Join us next week for our final episode of this podcast series, episode six, The Framing of Lucy Letby. We are crowdfunding this podcast to pay for its production costs. If you're able to support us, the link to the crowdfunder is on our social media feed. Was there ever a crime? The Trials of Lucy Letby was investigated, presented and produced by me, John Sweeney and Edward Abel Smith. This is a Chalk and Blade production, co-produced by Jason Phipps and Ruth Barnes. Ross Ramsey Golding is the editor. Legal services were provided by Sarah Van Dor Mackay at Review and Cleared. Research and reporting by Clucy de Oliveira. <laughs>